Good afternoon and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, BBRF's president and CEO. Today, Dr. Mindy Westland Schreiner will present self injuries thoughts and behaviors in youth. BBRF is the world's largest private funder of mental health research grants supporting transformative discoveries in order to develop improved treatments, cures, and methods of prevention. The high quality of the research we fund is made possible by the BBRF Scientific Council. This group of 194 prominent mental health researchers reviews each grant application and selects the most promising ideas with the greatest potential to lead to breakthroughs. The Scientific Council guides the foundation to fund creative and impactful basic, translational, and clinical research relevant to the whole spectrum of mental health. One reason that research funded by BBRF has such a great impact is because we do not limit our focus to one illness or condition. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded $450 million to fund more than 6,500 research grants around the world and across a broad spectrum of brain illnesses, including addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, schizophrenia, as well as suicide prevention. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Dr. Mindy Westland Schreiner. Dr. Westland Schreiner is an assistant professor at the University of Utah. She was a 2021 BBRF Young Investigator. Our webinar will begin with a presentation, which will then be followed by Q&A. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Feel free to submit your questions at any time. Following the presentation, I'll ask as many as time will allot. And now, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Westlin Schreiner. Mindy, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. I am really excited to be here and thank you for inviting me. Um, so I'll be presenting on self-injurious thoughts and behaviors in youth today. And to just start things off, a potential a potential disclosure conflict of interest is that I, I'll be presenting on some data that we have collected as part of Safe UT, which is a crisis app available in the state of Utah. And I'm a member of the Research Quality and Improvement Program, or REQUIP. Um, so that may be seen as a conflict of interest. So I just put it here to be on the safe side. Of course, this work would not be possible without a huge group of people from more or less all over the place who have contributed to the studies that I'll be presenting data on today. Um, I also want to highlight funding sources, including the NIH, um, as well as some preliminary data from my own BBRF Young Investigator Award that I'll get to toward the end of this talk. So I have today's talk structured around starting with a little bit of background, uh, introducing folks to what self-injury thoughts and behaviors are, followed by a little bit of information on accessible care with data from our SafeUT crisis app. I'll touch a little bit on neurobiology and how it's related to self-injury thoughts and behavior. I'll highlight some ongoing work, which more specifically is uh, our current BBRF funded study. And then I'll end by talking about broader applications, or in other words, what can individuals, communities, and society do to help this very pressing concern um, that is certainly uh, worthy of a lot of attention presently. So starting off with some background. So for folks who are less 
familiar. Self-injurious thoughts and behaviors, which I'll also refer to as SITBs because it's fewer syllables. Um, so this includes both so this includes both behaviors as well as thoughts or ideation. And so ideation or behaviors can be suicidal, can be non-suicidal, can also even be ambivalent. Um, ambivalent meaning thoughts of death or behavior, self-injurious behaviors in which the intent is unclear. Um, I also wanted to highlight that there is um, something that we call uh, passive death or passive suicidal ideation, for instance, which is when individuals think about um, wanting to die, such as going to sleep and not waking up, or thoughts such as if a meteor hit me right now, that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Um, so that is what we consider to be passive suicidal ideation, as there is no intent to actually kill oneself. Um, and this can then also bleed into ambivalent and active suicidal ideation. So I intentionally used a gradient actually in these figures to highlight that these thoughts and behaviors can't simply be just categorized and they often co-occur and transition quickly. So self-injurious thoughts and behaviors or SIPBs often begin between the ages of 12 and 14 years old. So very on um, in the grand scheme of things, making this a very important issue with regard to neurodevelopment and um, early intervention. Another thing to know about SIPBs is that they occur across diagnoses. So it's what we call transdiagnostic. So diagnoses include depression, borderline personality disorder, eating disorders, and even occur among individuals who do not meet criteria for any psychiatric disorder. And this is important to highlight because simply because if someone is not experiencing depression, that does not necessarily mean that they are free of self-injurious thoughts and behavior. Okay, so this has received a lot of media coverage during this past spring. We're seeing a pretty steady increase in the percentages of sadness, hopelessness, suicidal ideation, and suicide attempts among youth. So this is specifically high school students who have been surveyed. Um, I also want to highlight that this is not something that is currently assessed in the measure that um, is provided to youth nationally. Um, however, the current estimate of non-suicidal self-injury, which includes cutting, hitting, burning, um, is roughly 22 percent, um, which is has also increased a little bit in recent years. Um, and the importance of highlighting non-suicidal self-injury or NSSI in particular is that these individuals typically have histories of more frequent psychiatric hospitalizations. 70% of those who engage in non-suicidal self-injury attempt suicide in their lifetime, and 55% report having multiple suicide attempts. And when they do attempt suicide, they're more likely to require medical intervention. So I'm often asked two questions. So the first question is, why do youth engage in SIPBs? Why, why do kids self-harm? Why do kids think of suicide? Why do kids kill themselves? There are many reasons. So for non-suicidal self-injury in particular, the most common reason is typically emotion regulation. Um, so it's an effort to reduce negative emotional states. Um, other reasons that are fairly common include self-punishment, so feeling like one deserves to be hurt, um, to stop feeling numb or to keep them from dissociating. Some individuals describe this as an addictive-like urge, and some individuals engage in NSSI to avoid suicide. Suicide is similar in that many individuals who engage in suicidal behavior do so to escape aversive states. Um, so what I mean by that is that a lot of these individuals, they don't necessarily want to be dead. However, they 
no longer want to be alive because being alive is painful and really difficult at times. Um, so both suicide and non-suicidal self-injury um, and ideation can be driven by many things. So this includes feeling like one is a burden to others, feeling isolated or left out, and also feelings of hopelessness. The second question that I'm asked a lot, particularly lately, is why are rates increasing? Um, what effect has the pandemic ha had? Um, what effect does social media have? And what we do know is that we've been seeing increased rates uh, that have been happening well before the pandemic. However, the pandemic has certainly exacerbated these difficulties. So one study examined factors related to self-injurious thoughts and behaviors that were more prominent before the pandemic and then also after, well, during and after the pandemic, and some specific pandemic-related factors that have contributed to increased fitbees include parent-child relationship issues, stress around learning and school environment, as well as parent-perceived mobile phone overuse. So the one thing that is similar across like both pre-pandemic and during pandemic is this issue of social isolation from peers. This in particular has been an ongoing link to increased self-injurious thoughts and behavior in youth, which really highlights the importance of fostering social connectedness. Another potential reason for increased rates is a failure to adhere to what we call safe reporting guidelines. Um, in recent years, we've had high profile suicide deaths that were not reported on in a very responsible way. Um, and we've also seen um, problematic depictions of suicide in TV shows and movies. For instance, there has been um, an association between when the show 13 Reasons Why was released and an increase in suicide among youth. Um, we've also in recent years been seeing increased legislation targeting groups that are particularly vulnerable to self-injurious thoughts and behaviors, so the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and some folks also want like to note that we have been doing a better job at assessing SITBs in youth. More people are asking the questions as far as doctors, things like that. And this has likely had an impact on seeing rates increase. However, it's likely pretty insufficient to explain these increases on its own. And then finally, from a clinician perspective, um, as I do see adolescents um, in my own clinical experience, um, they're, and also talking among other um, friends and colleagues who work with this population, uh, it does appear that in recent years, societal concerns have become particularly prominent among youth. So issues such as systemic racism, legis legislative changes that impact friends and family and themselves, um, anxiety about climate change, anxiety about pandemic, the expense of college and they're living independently. So there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, right now that feels and kind of is out of control for many youth, which really contributes to this feeling of hopelessness, which can then drive self-injurious thoughts and behavior. All right, so I will talk a little bit about um, some data that we have regarding crisis chat services and youth that access. Um, the service. So a little bit of background on SafeUT. So SafeUT was created in response to suicide being the leading cause of death for youth aged 10 to 24 in the state of Utah. So in a reaction to that, the Utah State Legislature created a commission that led to the development of SafeUT, 
So this service first became available in early 2016 and is a free app available to students elementary through college, their educators, as well as their parents and guardians. Though so the availability of this app also expanded to include Utah National Guard members in 2019 and frontline workers in 2020. So SafePT is essentially a crisis line that offers anonymous support via text-based chat or phone call. Um, users can also anonymously provide tips regarding concerns that they may have about bullying, violence, drugs, and other issues. And these tr tips are then routed to the appropriate um, administration within schools and law enforcement if need be so that they can be triaged uh, and handled, which is particularly valuable um, given the issues that we've had with increased violence in our schools. So while there are many similarities to the National Suicide Hotline, uh, including 24-7 availability and the option to either call or text, there are some unique features of SafeUT in that it provides access to licensed clinicians who are master's level or higher, who respond to all incoming concerns by providing supportive or crisis counseling as well as referral services, which uh, depending on the acuity of the issue may include the deployment of what we call our mobile crisis outreach team, which exists in some states. Uh, it's essentially a, um, an alternative to law enforcement. They're individuals who can kind of come to the end of the person in need, and they're specifically trained in managing crisis. So as part of the research quality improvement program, we initiated some data collection to better understand who are these youth, how are they doing, what do they look like, what are their experiences. So some specific questions we had include, how common are self-injurious thoughts and behaviors in SafeUT users? What are the short-term effects of SafeUT contact? Is our individuals finding SafeUT to be helpful in handling their crisis and other presenting concerns? What other mental health services are, there, are they accessing besides uh, SafeUT? Are they, are they seeing therapists? Are they receiving any kind of additional formal mental health support? And then lastly, what barriers do they face in accessing additional mental health care? So working with IT, we offer the survey opportunity to one in five SafeUT users following a contact with at least 10 volleys. So what I mean by 10 volleys is a volley is basically a back and forth exchange between the SafeUT user and the clinician. Um, so they were, once they completed their interaction with the clinician, one in five SafeUT users that met this criteria were then presented with this survey opportunity. So while the op number of people who completed the survey was much lower than we'd anticipate given the number of times the opportunity was offered, it is also important to note that this opportunity is coming up immediately after they are having a chat with a safe UT clinician. So there's a trade-off between acquiring more temporally relevant data and minimizing re retrospective reporting as much as possible uh, versus perhaps not having the best timing um, for these youth. Um, on the other hand, delaying providing this opportunity until say like the day after their contact uh, pre presents additional challenges um, more most importantly uh, potentially compromising the un the un an anonymity of the service um, which is something that is super critical uh, in this group so for the purposes of today's presentation, we focus specifically on users who indicated they were in grade school, um, just so that we have a more similar group. And also because youth uh, in this age group in particular have unique experiences with regard to mental health access and barriers. So our sample was mostly female, followed by individuals who identified as gender, queer, or non-binary. Sexuality was also 
quite diverse with only 40% identifying as straight or heterosexual and the remainder identifying as LGBTQ or other. So over half of this sample identified as being a member of the LGBTQ plus community without our deliberately sampling this group. So this pattern is consistent with overwhelming research documenting societally perpetuated risk for mental health crises among these youth, including self-injury and suicide. I also wanted to note that these data were collected prior to the 2023 legislation um, that effectively banned gender affirming care for youth. Um, we will be starting to collect data again here soon. Um, in which one of the things that will be interesting to see will be to compare kind of the pre and post. All right, so as far as SITBs, we asked youth to report whether they have engaged in any self-injurious thoughts and behaviors in the two weeks leading up to this survey. So most of our sample experienced some kind of self-injurious thoughts and behavior in the past two weeks, with 72% reporting some kind of self-harm ideation. So this includes self-harm without suicidal intent, such as non-suicidal self-injury, ambivalent intent, uh, or thoughts of more active thoughts of suicide. Concerningly, 18% of our sample reported having attempted suicide in the past two weeks. Um, and then finally, uh, we had 50 or half of our sample reported engaging in some kind of self-harm behavior in the two weeks leading up to the survey. Um, so with regard to the attempted suicide, uh, again, consistent with research documenting increased risk for LGBTQ plus youth, individuals who identified as transgender or non-binary were significantly more likely to report suicide attempts in the past two weeks. Also, individuals who identified as being a sexual minority, in other words, not straight or heterosexual, they were also significantly more likely to report suicide attempts in the past two weeks. So we also asked participants to indicate which concerns they were experiencing at the time they contacted SafeUT. And then we asked them to rate each concern that they endorsed in intensity on a range of zero, being not at all intense, to five, being very intense. So we asked them to rate these intensity ratings before they contacted SafeUT and immediately after. Um, so for ease of presentation, concerns that included self-harm ideation or thoughts were grouped together here uh, into just a self-harm ideation shown in blue, um, whereas behaviors such as I was hurting myself without suicidal intent, with mixed intent, or with suicidal intent, uh, I, I've grouped together to show an orange here. And we did find that users or survey responders uh, indicated a significant decrease in the intensity of these concerns following their safe UT contact. Now, we were also interested in understanding what resources these youth are currently using. So 43% of youth um, reported currently receiving some sort of formal mental health service. Uh, so this was typically either outpatient therapy or some form of medication management. Um, however, there were um, a handful of people who reported um, some current, being currently treated through a day treatment program or intensive outpatient program. Now, what was particularly striking was that these youth receiving treatment were not any less likely to report a suicide attempt. Um, this kind of leads, begs the question of whether these youth are feeling sufficiently supported by their providers in discussing be related content. Uh, existing work looking at barriers to disclosure has highlighted 
uh, particular concerns such as fear of consequences, such as overreaction in response to disclosing self-injurious thoughts and behavior, uh, unwanted hospitalization, and sometimes uh, there are some providers who will refuse to continue seeing certain patients if they engage in SIPBs. Um, also among youth in particular, there's concerns about breaches in confidentiality uh, with, between the provider and parents or guardians, uh, as well as non-collaborative disclosure to parents or caregivers regarding self-injurious thoughts and behaviors. So this kind of highlights a, a need uh, a further attention with regard to clinician training, um, which we'll talk a little bit more as we wrap up in the end. So a primary aim of this study was to better characterize the barriers that youth experience in receiving additional mental health support beyond safe UT. And the most frequently endorsed barrier to accessing mental health services among youth was not wanting to talk to their parent or caregiver. This was endorsed by 42% of, of these youth, and this was followed by overwhelming, in which 30% endorsed that it felt too overwhelming, and then uh, the third most common barrier was cost. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit now about uh, neurobiology and how it relates to SIPPIs. So as thus far, when it comes to SIPPI inter interventions for adolescents, there's currently a lack of interventions that focus specifically on youth SIPPIs. Instead, particularly outside of academic medical centers, providers often focus more on the co-occurring or overarching diagnosis, such as depression. So a more holistic approach, such as one that integrates biological measurement, such as neuroimaging, may aid in treatment development by guiding our understanding of mechanisms of change and prediction of treatment response. So what we know to date can help provide direction in how we move forward with this integration. So in doing so, we may confirm the relevance of these neurobiological targets to SIPBs and whether or how these targets are amenable to treatment. And then we can use these findings to guide optimization and even create new interventions, which could then potentially be tailored to the individual. So first I'll talk a little bit about functional connectivity. Um, so functional connectivity is basically one of the ways in which we use functional MRI to see what's going on in the brain. And so for those less familiar, um, functional connectivity refers to the correlation between bra brain regions and their blood oxygen level dependent or bold signal. So when we talk about positive functional connectivity or positive correlations, we interpret this as brain regions that are serving similar goals. In contrast, when we talk about negative functional connectivity or negative correlations, we interpret this as brain regions that are serving opposing goals. So functional connectivity can be measured at rest, which we call resting state functional connectivity, and it can also be measured during the duration of a task, um, which I actually won't talk about today. I'll focus mostly on resting state. All right. So um, kind of going back to um, one of the studies that I had included in my dissertation in grad school, we had recruited 25 adolescents with non-suicidal self-injury as well as 20 non-clinical controls. And we focused specifically on functional connectivity of the amygdala, which is shown here in the um, red splotches up above, the red blobs, and um, we focus on the amygdala given its role in emotion and also more typically uh, folks associated with threat. Um, and we found that individuals with non-suicidal self-injury showed greater connectivity between the amygdala and the supplementary motor area and dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. So this region down here. 
so the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex is implicated in interpersonal sensitivity, whereas the supplementary motor area is involved in the planning of complex motor movements. So the supplementary motor area is likely involved in the moments before and during engagement in non-suicidal self-injury. And one potential interpretation of this finding is perhaps a, an excessive influence of negative affect or just affect in general, uh, whether positive or negative, upon the planning of movements. Interestingly, um, in a clinical trial using a subset of folks with non-suicidal self-injury, 18 of them in particular. 18 of these individuals subsequently completed an eight-week course of treatment with a dietary supplement. Um, I'm not going to get in the weeds with it today, but this is a dietary supplement that has been used uh, in the past in treating impulsive and compulsive behaviors such as skin picking and hair pulling. And following treatment, these individuals actually showed reduced connectivity between the amygdala and supplementary motor area, um, among other findings beyond the scope of this presentation. However, this finding of a reduction in connectivity and something that showed what we might refer to, refer to as hyperconnectivity, um, this highlights that there is promise in using neuroimaging methods to identify aspects of brain functioning that may be targets for, in, may be targets for intervention. <clears throat> now, uh, for my master's thesis, um, I examined a sample of 58 adolescents between the ages of 12 and 19 years old who were diagnosed with current major depressive disorder. So here I examined resting state functional connectivity to examine the relationship between suicidality and connectivity involving the precuneus and posterior cingulate cortex shown here in green. And so the precuneus and posterior cingulate cortex are key regions within the default mode network. And there's a little bit of background knowledge. The default mode network is essentially comprised of areas of the brain that are engaged during rest. So this includes like mind wandering, ruminating. Um, so think of it as autopilot, in other words. So down here, these images show regions that show precuneus, posterior cingulate cortex connectivity that is associated with suicidality. So specifically, greater suicidality is associated with increased connectivity between the precuneus and posterior cingulate cortex and, a, and clusters that include the pre and post central gyri, the middle frontal gyrus, and the inferior frontal gyrus. These areas are implicated in empathy, social perception and, reject, and rejection, attention, the early stages of emotion induction, and importantly, for the purposes of this talk, rumination. So more specifically, our finding of suicidality being associated with increased connectivity between the posterior cingulate cortex and inferior frontal gyrus happened to map on well to an intervention called rumination-focused cognitive behavioral therapy in which youth with remitted major depressive disorder demonstrated decreased connectivity between the posterior cingulate cortex and inferior frontal gyrus following rumination-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, or RFCBT. So this particular work that I'm showing here was done at the time by a separate group from our own, uh, which I have since began working with first as a postdoc and now presently as a faculty member. Um, so this is kind of like a teaser as far as where this presentation is going to start going here. All right, so what is rumination? So rumination is repetitive thinking. Um, often in, in our world, we typically call it repetitive negative thinking since we're more focused on when it becomes problematic. So rumination is something that we all do, hence why so many of these memes are relatable. Um, However, people differ in the amount of control that they have over their rumination. So sometimes rumination becomes problematic and disruptive. So with depression in particular, increased rumination after recovering from a major depressive episode 
um, and continued elevated rumination, even when one is doing well, confers risk for depression recurrence. So how does rumination relate to suicide and self-injury? So rumination increases distress while also impeding active and adaptive problem solving. So rumination often precedes, co-occurs with, and is predictive of self-injurious thoughts and behaviors. Um, it is also fairly easy to conceptualize persistent ideation of self-injury and suicide. So su like suicidal ideation in and of itself, for example, um, is a form of rumination. So some studies, or rather uh, a couple of studies, have associated suicide-specific rumination with suicide attempts. Um, and the reason that this is particularly concerning and conferring risk for later suicidal behavior is that this repeated mental rehearsal of suicidal be behavior may reduce someone's innate drive towards self-preservation meaning that typically we want to do what we can to stay alive um, and suicide essentially has to um, and for one to um, for one to engage in suicidal behavior uh, this innate drive has to be kind of tampered down um, because it is something that is just kind of instinctual Okay, so neurobiologically, there are differences in brain activation during rumination versus distraction among youth with varying levels of self-injury. So we recently examined the relation between lifetime episodes of non-suicidal self-injury and brain activation during rumination in a sample of adolescents with remitted depression. Now, I talk specifically about non-suicidal self-injury here. Uh, however, the same pattern emerges, emerges when we include um, all self-injurious behavior. So whether it be suicidal behavior, non-suicidal behavior, or ambivalent. Um, so one of our findings highlighted the precuneus, um, which comes up again. So here's our gray blob. So the precuneus is actually the blob that's further back. Um, and we found that there was a greater contrast between precuneus activation during the rumination blocks relative to the distraction blocks of the task. Among adolescents, we had more lifetime episodes of non-suicidal self-injury. In other words, the more self-injury, the greater the difference is in brain activation between these two conditions. So as we know, the precuneus has been implicated in rumination and typically the precuneus shows greater activation during rumination blocks of this task. In contrast, uh, studies have found that during more cognitively demanding tasks, the precuneus shows decreased activation. So we broke this down and looked at each of these conditions separately. And we would have anticipated that the rumination blocks of the task would be driving this difference. Instead, reduced activation of these regions during distraction uh, really drove this effect, as you can see in red here. And this may suggest that fully engaging in distraction may be more cognitively demanding among adolescents with more lifetime episodes of self-injury. In other words, individuals with non-suicidal self-injury or self-injury in general may find themselves having to employ more cognitive resources when they need to disengage from negative mood states without the aid of self-injury, which can thereby serve to maintain and reinforce an SSI. Now, so I mentioned RFCBT or rumination focused cognitive behavioral therapy briefly before. So I'm bringing us back to it here. So just a brief overview of some of the principles of RFCBT. So in this therapy, we conceptualize rumination as a habit. So something that is typically done without realizing it, hence why the default mode network within the brain is typically involved. So during therapy, we identify where people tend to ruminate or get stuck in an effort to better target it. We also focus on details, adaptive problem solving, and engaging 
with experience. Specifically, unhelpful rumination involves passive, abstract, evaluative, analyzing, and intellectualizing events by overgeneralizing and engaging in global thinking. So RFCDT aims to shift this thinking to be more active, specific, experiential, and concrete by focusing on the details. So unhelpful thinking or rumination is focused more on meanings and implications rather than how to move forward. There is also an over-reliance on interpretation versus what actually happened when it comes to problematic rumination. With regard to engaging with experience, this is a focus within the therapy as focusing on engaging uh, and fulfilling and absorbing activities encourages patients or us in general to slow down and pace ourselves, which reduces the sense of being under pressure or in a rush, um, which when we're under pressure or in a rush, this actually encourages rumination. So like any good therapy model, there are many acronyms. Two key ones are here. The first is BIG, which stands for becoming more aware. So kind of early sessions in therapy, we focus on being able to notice when you are ruminating in the first place so that you can do something to change it. The I is increasing positive emotions. So as straightforward as it sounds, we tend to ruminate less when we are engaged in activities we enjoy. So one of the things we do is have folks engage in activities they enjoy. G, getting unstuck, is using skills to move on from the rumination, to break that cycle. Now, how do we achieve big? We do this by using ASK, yet another acronym. Don't worry, I'm not going to get into the other acronyms today. Um, but A stands for active, so doing things instead of thinking about them. Like I mentioned before, rumination, we uh, rumination we define as a pretty like passive sort of behavior, so we do the opposite in figuring out ways to be active. S is specific, so avoiding generalization and focusing on the matter at hand. Um, one thing that I use with youth in particular is kind of the snowball effect in which they get a poor grade in the assignment and then they start ruminating about it. I think if I do poorly on the assignment, that'll do poorly in the test. And if I do poorly on the test, that'll do poorly in the class. And if I do poorly on the class, I won't pass the class. I'll have to retake the class or I'll have to drop out of high school and I won't have to graduate high school. And then we kind of go on and on and on until they, the rumination example ends up with them living in their parents' basement in their 50s and having no friends. Um, so an exaggeration, but it is an example of how rumination is not specific. So we focus on being specific in, to combat that. And lastly is kind. So showing compassion to yourself and others. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about ongoing work um, and how all of this relates to what we're working on currently. So we're currently conducting a BBRF funded study called Reducing Self-Injury and Suicidal Thinking or RESIST. So this study is recruiting teens with self-injurious thoughts and behaviors, having them complete an MRI, followed by 10 to 14 sessions of RFCBT. And then after therapy, we scan them again using MRI and we follow up with them at three and six months after. So our goals here are to determine whether RFCDT is an effective treatment for youth with self-injurious thoughts and behaviors by reducing their intensity and frequency, as well as reducing re-hospitalizations as we're particularly focused on recruiting youth who have been recently discharged from an inpatient psychiatry unit. Our other goal is to understand whether and how RFCBT impacts the brain within this population. Of course, we have many other questions um, that we are eager to dig into, which includes looking at whether baseline neuroimaging data can predict outcomes such as sustained positive treatment effects. So here's some of our preliminary data thus far for five youth whose data we have entered. So we see that with regard to both ideation, whether non-suicidal or suicidal, um, and also with non-suicidal self-injury behavior, 
these thoughts and behaviors decrease from baseline to post-treatment and then remain decreased out to three months post-treatment. Um, I didn't include suicide attempts here uh, simply because it was very low frequency. So it was kind of a fairly unexciting graph where it was like basically just was at zero the whole time. Um, so non-suicidal self-injury is certainly more frequent, at least within this group that we have been recruiting. We also collected two measures of rumination. So one is the ruminative, ruminative response scale, which is widely used and assesses problematic rumination. And the second is the suicide rumination scale, which assesses suicide specific rumination. So, so far, we've seen a reduction on both of these scales that remains low at three month follow up. So one of the things to note that this is the first study to examine RFCBT specifically with this population. And even still, not many groups beyond our team have applied RFCBT to adolescents within a research setting. So because of this, the study also involves making adjustments to make the therapy model more tailored to adolescents with SIPBs. So I'm the primary therapist uh, for this study, so I can speak a little bit to uh, what I have been experiencing on the clinician end of thing, uh, um, the clinician end of things. Um, some of the things that are slightly different than uh, what I've done with our remitted depression studies is spending more time on different examples of rumination um, that have happened recently to capture not just like problematic rumination more generally, but also making sure to really nail down rumination directly tied to SIPBs, because not all rumination leads to self-injurious thoughts and behavior. So we're kind of tackling two different, two separate but related things here. And additionally, um, I found myself introducing intervention skills with this study earlier um, that I have in our other studies with teens with remitted depression. Um, often with an emphasis on the K and ask, so kindness, especially self-kindness, which is something that uh, these youth in particular really do struggle with. Um, and I do this so they can begin practicing some kind of coping skill earlier, given that these youth are typically in pretty significant distress. And so having something that is fairly easy to grasp onto and fairly concrete early on helps with buy-in and also just helps them have something that they can use during the week before we have our next session. All right, so I'm gonna talk about broader applications. So consistent with the framework of RFCBT, I'm gonna to return to these why questions that I am often asked and Focus instead on the how. So this is to shift away from more abstract thinking, typically involving meanings and implications to more concrete actions. So specifically, how can individuals, communities, and society help? So this is clearly a significant issue in which we kind of need an all hands on deck approach. So folks that are able to help, we'd love to help. So I'm often asked uh, among some, some folks like, okay, so all of these things are happening. What can I do to be more helpful? What can I do to make an impact? So I'm gonna start with the individual level. So firstly, showing and encouraging support of LGBTQ plus youth. So our work here supports the overwhelming research indicating that these youth are at especially high risk for self-harm and suicide. And studies have um, consistently shown that family support significantly reduces this risk, um, making this a pretty important area to focus on. Uh, another area uh, in which folks can be potentially helpful is broaden this definition of trusted adult beyond parents and caregivers. So whether you're a parent yourself and you're trying to proactively problem solve with your youth, 
or maybe you're a teacher or a relative um, and you're having conversations with them about, okay, so who do you go to if you need help or you're concerned? So when having these conversations, consider adults who may, might be less intimidating for them to talk to. So this may actually, instead of a parent, maybe a teacher, counselor, coach, relative, uh, and it's important that when you can work this out with the youth, are they able to readily identify someone they can talk to if they need help? If they aren't able to, you can offer suggestions and perhaps even ask the youth what they would need or look for in order to feel safe. Initiate the conversation. So talking about mental health regularly, um, not just when something feels off, to just make this something that is easier to talk about. Also include direct questions about self-harm and suicide. So contrary to what many people think, and even clinicians make this uh, assumption, research actually consistently shows that asking about suicide does not increase suicide risk. Um, this has been super consistent in research. In fact, asking about suicide can help reduce risk. And if something comes up, problem solve collaboratively, not coercively with youth. So approaching mental health challenges as a team helps youth feel as though they have some autonomy in their decision making, which can be meaningful considering that youth struggling with mental health challenges can feel stuck or trapped. This also helps with this feeling of having more control, which can also make a difference in terms of feeling hopeless about one situation. Uh, encourage healthy social relationships. So humans need social interactions. This is especially the case for youth as engaging more with peers is a healthy part of development. This is one of the areas in which a black and white approach to, to technology can be harmful. So for some youth, technology can be a key way for them to connect socially in the event they have difficulty connecting with peers in person. These difficulties can be driven by like actual physical limitations, say for folks who live in rural communities, um, for say more marginalized populations in which they want to talk to people with similar experiences and there's not a whole lot of people around them physically who fall in that category. Uh, also among individuals who, you know, maybe having face-to-face -face interpersonal interactions is super uncomfortable. However, whether online or in, in person, the same principle applies as these should be healthy and safe relationships. And then finally, reduce, as, reduce access to lethal means. So this seems fairly simple to some, but can make a significant difference. This is especially the case with firearms. A suicide attempts with firearms has a higher fatality rate relative to other means. Additionally, firearms are also tied as being one of the most frequent causes of suicide deaths in youth. Now, for communities and programs, um, training and support for self-injurious thoughts and behavior assessment and treatment. So this is more directed toward programs that educate our mental health workforce. There is a surprising lack of training in SITBs for clinicians in many programs. So making sure that this is a very intentional and thoroughly done area of training, providing mental health education to the public, so encouraging these conversations, empowering youth to engage in self-advocacy and promoting youth leadership. So youth want to be involved and make a difference. This particular generation of youth is very savvy when it comes to mental health. Um, and that's something that it's important to many of them. They want to be involved and make a difference. Increase partnership across other programs and communities, including with researchers. This can help kind of quicken the pace of like discovery and just making greater strides in our understanding. Thoughtfully identify and implement strategies that are supported by research and engage in continued evaluation of these programs. So the eva continued evaluation is particularly important 
given that a lot of our research is restricted to a pretty non-diverse population, so primarily white individuals. However, we've seen with uh, Black youth in particular, there have been pretty startling increases in self-injurious thoughts and behaviors among that group in particular. And as far as for society goes, so much more bigger picture, um, promoting inclusive LGBTQ plus legislation. So a recent study found that suicide attempts among LGBTQ plus youth were significantly lower in states with inclusive LGBTQ plus legislation. This makes a difference. Um, supporting mental health literacy and social emotional learning. So this may include um, programming in schools that provide some education on social emotional learning. And it goes without saying, uh, continued investment in education, access, research, and evaluation, addressing socioeconomic barriers. So uh, life is much more worth living when you're not worrying about satisfying your basic needs. So this is a particularly important area um, in need of addressing. Expanding and supporting mental health workers. So not just making training more accessible, but also doing things that make life a little easier for clinicians. So this particularly includes improving mental health parity and incre increasing insurance reimbursement rates, et cetera, make life a, a little bit easier. And then finally, uh, given our work and the work of uh, Jessica Schleider's group, um, her she recently published a paper on this, um, evaluate parental consent requirements for mental health care. What can we do better here? How can we help youth access the care that they need? Um, do we need to look at lowering or changing the age for consent requirements? Do we need to add more specifics on what youth can access without parental consent? This is definitely an area um, in need of further, further investigation and further development. That said, uh, I would like to re-acknowledge um, all these people, plus many more that I cannot fit on one slide. And again, uh, thank you to BBRF uh, for this opportunity, as well as the opportunity to conduct my own research. Um, we're really excited moving forward to see what we find. And that concludes my presentation, and I'm excited to answer any questions. Well, Mindy, I want to thank you for just a wonderful presentation. I love how you connect some of the clinical aspects of your work with basic science and you bring it all together so beautifully um, and I also like how you describe how individuals, groups, society um, can have an impact uh, on these issues. I'm going to just ask one question because you, you answered a lot of the questions but I have a question and that is um, what can somebody do? As you said rumination is very common somebody's experiencing this or they know that a loved one is what should they do what's the first step Ooh, that's a that's a tough one because my clinician brain like automatically kind of jumps to like what we do in therapy however that's not necessarily uh, the most appropriate course of action uh in most cases outside of that um a lot i think what can make a difference is really that engaging with experience um, point that the RFCBT model makes um, and also looking for ways to help connect um, into like say the here and now for instance. So engaging in more things that people enjoy on a regular basis, um, sometimes activity scheduling, um, that can actually be pretty important. So uh, I feel like I, I'm running into this, into this quite a bit recently where folks are like, yeah, let's do that sometime. And then it never happens. Um, but being intentional about like, hey, we should go do this on Tuesday night. Um, meet me here, I'll pick you up or let's sit down and talk about it. 
on Sunday at this time. Um, so being concrete and focusing on things that are more enjoyable and help folks get engaged. Thank you, very good, very, very good advice. Um, I want to again say thank you, Mindy, for the work you're doing, you can, that you're continuing to do. I'm sure we'll have you back to give an update as your research continues. Um, so thank you so much. I also want to thank everybody who joined us today. And I'd ask people to please consider making a donation to BBRF. 100% of every dollar donated for research is invested in our research grants. We're able to do this because our operating expenses are covered by separate foundation grants. This means that when you donate a dollar for research, that dollar goes directly to the scientists. To make a gift, please visit the BBRF website at bbrfoundation.org or call us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it, with someone else, please visit the events and webinar page on our website. And I'd like to invite people to join us again on November 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern time when Dr. Ryan Haringa, Director of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health will present Pediatric PTSD neurobiology and treatment. Thank you and remember, together we can dramatically improve the lives of those living with mental illness and enable more people to live full, happy and productive lives. Take care.